Hello, dear classmates. Welcome back to our advanced ATPG chapter. In this video, we are going to talk about an interesting idea: timing aware ATPG. So let's do a simple review. In our potent algorithm, when we choose propagation path, we said that potent algorithm tends to choose a shorter path. Rather than the longer path, because we want to save runtime. This may be a good idea to make our runtime shorter. However, this may not be a good idea to produce quality and effective test patterns. In the Stanford-Murphy experiment, it has been shown that some output do not fail on the tester. In the experimental result, for example, in this particular chip, the simulation shows that this fault should be propagated to many outputs. However, on the tester, we only observe the fault effect propagated to output number nine, output number five, but not output number two. Or number eight. This shows that if we propagate for effect only to the short path, we can result in test escape. For example, suppose we only apply this test pattern, we could have test escape. So, in conclusion, the previous timing unaware ATPG tends to choose shorter path. But this may not be a good idea. Now let's introduce three different types of paths. Consider a fault here. Suppose we want to test this fault. We can activate and propagate this fault effect through a very long path. Path type A. This is called actual longest path. That means this path is the sensitizable longest path in this design. Let's say in this example, it's five nanosecond. However, sometimes it's very difficult to always activate and propagate the actual longest path. So sometimes we could test this fault. Through a shorter path, like path type B. This path is a sensitized path. It's activated and propagated by a certain test pattern. For this example, it's four nanosecond, a little bit shorter than the actual longest path. We also have a third type of path, type C. Which is very very long, nine nanosecond, but this is a false path because it's not sensitizable or is functionally useless. So we don't need to test false path in our testing. We can ignore false path. When we operate this chip, we use TMC, which is system clock timing. In this example, it's six nanosecond, which is one nanosecond longer than the actual longest path. TMC is limited by the actual longest path because TMC is used in the functional operation, so it cannot be shorter than the actual longest path in our design. However, on our tester, sometimes it's difficult to apply a very fast test, so we use TC, which is test clock timing. This can be limited by our tester. For example, in this figure, the TC is seven nanosecond, which is one nanosecond slower than TMC. Typically. Our test clock timing is slower than system clock timing. 
So now we have two different margin. The first margin, TMGM, is the difference between actual longest pass and system clock timing. In this example, TMGN is 6 minus 5, which is 1 nanosecond. The second margin is TDE. It's the difference between sensitized pass and test clock. In this example, is 7 minus 4. So we have 3 nanosecond is our TDE. In order to have a good test, we want to sensitize our path as long as possible, but we don't want to test the false path. Now, the idea of small delay defect, SDD, has been proposed by many researchers. SDD are those small delay defects which are not easily detected by slow speed testing. On our right hand side, we see this curve, which is defect size and density distribution. On the x-axis, it is the defect size, S. On the y-axis, we have F of S, which is defect density. The area under this curve represent the number of defects. If you don't remember this, you can review our video 1.3. Continue from our previous example. Our TMGM is 1 nanosecond and our TDE is 3 nanosecond. So we can see on our left hand side this area correspond to very small defect. They are so small that they do not affect our functional operation. So they are called redundant SDD. Suppose let's say we have a defect of size 0 0.5 nanosecond. It will not harm our functional operation. On our right hand side, this area correspond to very large delay defects which are detected already. Suppose we have a 4 nanosecond big delay defect. So it will be longer than our test clock timing so we can detect this delay fall. Now our concern is the gray area. The size of defect is smaller than 3 nanosecond but larger than 1 nanosecond. In this gray area, this defect can potentially be harmful to our functional operation because it's larger than 1 nanosecond. However, we cannot detect it due to our poor test quality. So we want to minimize the area to reduce our DPN loss. So how can we do that? There are two solutions to reduce the DPN. We can move this line to the left by using a smaller TDE which means as speed testing. So we can move this test clock faster. If we can apply the same test clock timing as the functional clock timing, then this is called as speed testing. Or even more aggressively, some people use faster than as speed testing. That means TMC is larger than TC. And the second solution is that we can use longer sensitized path. That means we push this to the right. In order to do that, we need good quality test patterns. 
So timing aware ATPG can sensitize longer paths to improve DPM loss caused by STD. Now let's introduce a timing aware ATPG example proposed by Mentor Graphic in 2006. In the first step, we pre-select long paths in the design and then we generate test patterns and then we calculate the delay and we drop detected faults that meet our fault dropping criteria. This process is repeated until we have enough fault coverage or time out. Please note that this is just an example. There are also other Timing Aware ATPG algorithm available in our reference. Now let's see step one. In this step, we pre-select long activation paths and the propagation paths in our design using Static Timing Analyzer (STA). For example, for this gate, we have two inputs. From STA result, we know that the lower gate input corresponds to a longer path. So we would assign more probability to the lower path. When we backtrace in our ATPG, we are more likely to choose the lower gate input than the upper gate input. So this will help us to travel the longer path instead of the shorter path. Similarly, for each fan out stem, we will analyze the timing and we would assign more probability to those branches that propagate the full effect through longer path. For this example, the fan out stem C, we would assign more probability to the lower branch than the upper branch because the lower path is potentially longer. Now let's see example. In the second step, we will generate test patterns according to the weight determined by the first step. Suppose our target fall is C slow to fall fall. To propagate this fall, we would choose the lower path and for this fan out stem because the upper branch and the lower branch are equally likely. Let's say we choose the lower branch. And then we generate this test pattern which travel through a long path rather than uh, the other short paths. Let's see another example of activation. Let's say the target fault is Y slow to 4 fold. To activate this fault in the first vector V1, we will require a 1. We have two input to backtrace. According to the probability, decided by the first step. We would choose the lower gate input. So we would generate a test pattern that activate the fall through the lower longer path rather than the upper shorter path. This can be simply done by slightly changing our ATPG algorithm. Now it's time for you to work on a quiz. Consider this circuit where the inverter gate delay is 1 and the other gate delays are 2. Consider H slow to rise 4. Now please generate a timing aware test pattern. Please pause video and work on this quiz. Okay, have you done? Now. We want to create a rising transition at H. For vector 1, 
According to our algorithm, we will select the lower gate input. So we will backtrace to B and C. So both B and C are assigned to 0. E is 0, J is 1, K is 0. A can be don't care. In vector 2, we want to create 1 at H. So A must be 1, either B or C is 1. In this way, we create the 1 here, and uh, so K is still 0. Now, in this way, we can detect this fourth through a long path. Have you got it correctly? Now that we have test patterns, we can calculate delay for each node. First, arrival time AT of node X is the time to launch transition from primary input or pseudo primary input to a certain node X. We can calculate the arrival time from input to output, level by level. Starting from input transition where AT are equal to 0. For example, the arrival time of input A is 0, D is 0, similarly E is 0. However, if a certain input or node is not changing, then the arrival time is NA not available. Now we can do the calculation from left to right level by level. When we do this calculation, if a certain gate output X is changing from a controlled value to a non-controlled value, then we take the latest non-controlling input transition. For example, for this NAND gate, both gate inputs are changing from 0 to 1. So they are changing from controlling value to non-controlling value. We will take the latest transition. So arrival time of y is equal to 3. In this example, we assume that every gate delay are equally 1. Similar thing happen if gate output is changing from a non-control value to a control value. Then we will take the minimum of gate input arrival time, which means the earliest transition of a certain input that is changing to a controlling value. In this way, we can calculate arrival time of the whole circuit. Now, we need to calculate the propagation time, PT of X, which means the time to propagate the full effect from node X to primary output or pseudo primary output. There are two different methods. For method 1, we can do a forward calculation, fold by fold. For example, we can calculate from R to Y and Z. Then we can calculate the propagation time from Q to Y and Z. And then we can calculate the propagation time to D to Y and Z. You can see that this is a very slow process, and we have many many overlap calculation which is a waste of time. So this is not a good method. In method 2, we can actually do a non-robust path backtrace. In video 9.2, we said that a gate is non-robustly sensitized when the side input is in non-controlling value at the second vector. We can actually apply this technique to do a 
backtrace starting from y and z we can backtrace to s r and the p and we can backtrace to q please note that we don't backtrace to b because b is not non-robustly sensitized and then we backtrace to a c and the d similarly we don't backtrace e because E is not non-robustly sensitized. We can see that this calculation is faster than method 1 and then there is no calculation overlap. So this method is better. Now we can calculate propagation time. Given a circuit and a test pattern, we trace the non-robustly sensitized path if a gate input is non-robustly sensitized, then the gate input propagation time is equal to gate output propagation time plus gate delay. Otherwise, if the gate input is non-robustly sensitized, it's not available. So we can do this calculation. When we come across the fan now stem, we take the maximum of the propagation time of all the fan out branches. Please note that if there is any fan out reconvergence, then we must take care of this carefully. We will not go into the detail in this video. So we can do this backtrace to Q and then to see. Please know that E and the B are not backtraced, so their propagation time are not available. Now we have AT and PT. We can calculate the propagation delay PD of X, which is the time to travel from input to output through the node X. PD of X is simply AT of X plus PT of X. So we can do this calculation very easily. But be careful. If PT is NA or AT is NA, then the propagation delay is not available. For example, for nodes C and P, their PD are not available because they don't have arrival time. Similarly, for B and E, their propagation delay are also NA because their propagation time are not available. Finally, with propagation delay calculated, we can decide which fork can be dropped from our four list. A four F is dropped when two conditions are met. First condition is that the transition delay for F must be detected. That means AT must not be NA and PT must not be NA. What's the reason? You can think about it. The second criterion is PD of F is long enough. Please note that this is a user defined for drop criteria. User can specify the criteria for a fault to be dropped. Let's say in this example, we request that PD of a fault must be greater or equal to 3 to be dropped. So in this example, given this test pattern, for the first requirement, there are 8 Transition delay 4 that can be detected including A, D, Q, Q1, R, S, Y, and Z. However, for the second requirement, only 6 of them meet the 4 drop requirement. PD of A is only 2, so it's too short, so it cannot be dropped. Also, S slow to rise 4 is too short, 
PD is only 2, so it cannot be dropped. So the definition of a full coverage for timing aware test set is the number of drop transition delay fall over the number of total transition delay fall. Now it's time for you to work on a quiz. Suppose that the gate delay of inverter is 1 and the other are 2. Given this test pattern, please decide the AT and the PT for all the nodes in the circuit. Please calculate the PD of E. Question number 2. Suppose we require that PD must be 4 to drop the fault. So can we drop E slow to 4-4? Four, four? Please now pause the video and work on the quiz. OK, are you ready for the answer? Starting from input, both B and the C, their arrival time are 0. And then we could calculate the arrival time of E is 2. And uh, we can calculate the arrival time of H, which is also 2. J is 3. For K, because there is no transition, so its arrival time is not available. Now let's calculate the propagation delay. Starting from input K, whose propagation time is 0, and uh, we can calculate along the path which is non-robustly sensitized. Please note that J is non-robustly sensitized because H is 0 at vector 2. For node J, the propagation time is 2. And then we can propagate this through the inverter. So we have 3 here. And then because both B and the C are non-robustly sensitized. So their propagation time are 5. So for node E, its arrival time plus propagation time is 5. So 5 is larger than 4. So yes, we can drop E slow to 4 fold. Have you got it correctly? Now let's see a real data from the AOSI logic experiment. They tested a total of 32,000 chips and they identified 23 small delay defects. One of them escaped the slow test but failed fast functional test. This corresponds to 31 dpm. This is a SDD test escape. If we don't use timing aware or fast functional test, we could miss this chip. In this experiment, they perform a stress to burning the chip. After the stress, they found that four of them failed the stress. This corresponds to SDD with reliability issue, which correspond to 124 dpm. And uh, 18 of them still survive the test. So they are SDD without reliability problem. So from this experiment, we can see that to detect SDD is important so that we can guarantee our quality. However, if we do a test with very stringent condition, then we can have some overkill. In summary, in this video, we talk about small delay defect SDD, which are becoming more and more important for modern technologies. So how can we detect the SDD? We can either use a faster test or we can use better quality test pattern. Timing aware ATPG tries to activate long pass and propagate the full effect through the long pass. So the test pattern 
is better in quality. And we also explain the algorithm of timing aware ATPG. The advantage of timing aware ATPG is that we can detect SDD, we can reduce DPM or reduce the potential reliability issues. However, timing aware ATPG is longer in terms of runtime and the test length. Thank you for watching the video.